Your texts were never private. And I'm not just talking about the ones you sent years ago. Even the messages you're sending right now, the ones you assume are encrypted, can still be pulled, stored, and quietly scanned. People treat their phones like locked safes, but those safes come with back doors that almost nobody talks about. Governments know about them, hackers know about them, and so do the companies running the apps you trust most. In this video, I'm gonna show you how these tools really work, why the protections you think you have aren't what they seem, and the concrete steps you can take to keep your conversations private. My name's Addie Lamar, and for 15 years, I've been working in cybersecurity. Let's get into it. Everyone assumes their texts are private, but that's never really been true. Sending an SMS is like writing a message on a postcard with a pencil, then handing it to a stranger. Anyone in the middle can read it. They don't need a warrant or a heads up, they can just intercept it. And it's not just SMS. Paul Manafort, the former Trump campaign chairman, who was later convicted of tax and bank fraud, was using WhatsApp, assuming end-to-end -end encryption meant that he was protected. He wasn't. The FBI didn't hack his phone, they just grabbed his iCloud backups. Everything was there in plain text. If they can do that with a political insider, what do you think they can do with yours? You think you're safe because your app says encrypted, but let's test that. SMS is just raw text. It doesn't have any encryption in transit or encryption at rest. Your phone carrier can read it, law enforcement can tap it, and anyone with the right equipment can capture it. And yet it's still used for bank codes, password resets, even medical alerts. It's not private and it never was. A message looks secure, but only between Apple devices. The moment you text an Android user, it silently downgrades to SMS. And here's the bigger problem. If you use iCloud backups, and most people do by default, Apple stores your messages along with the keys to unlock them. That means that Apple can access them and so can law enforcement. Apple has turned over iMessage data in multiple investigations. Full encrypted backups exist now under advanced data protection, but you still have to enable it yourself, and most people don't. WhatsApp uses the Signal protocol for encryption. That part is solid, but if you back up your chats to iCloud or Google Drive, that copy is unencrypted, which means plain text available for anyone with access. Investigators regularly use this loophole, and even if your chats are protected, WhatsApp still collects metadata, like who you talk to, when you talk to them, your location and device details, and that metadata is logged and shared with Meta. In court, it's in the metadata, not the messages that becomes evidence. Then Telegram markets itself as private, but the defaults tell a different story. Most chats are not end-to-end -end encrypted, only secret chats are. Everything else is stored in Telegram servers, where Telegram holds the keys. On top of that, they don't use widely peer-reviewed protocol like Signals. They built their own, known as MT Proto. Cryptographers have flagged this as risky, and when pressured by governments like in Germany in 2022, Telegram has turned over user data. So, how private are your messages really? For most people, the problem isn't that encryption is broken, it's that the defaults are designed for convenience, not security. The reason you even have private messaging today is because a few cryptographers refuse to give up. Back in the early 1990s, the US government was panicking. The internet was exploding, strong encryption was spreading. And for the first time, they realized they might lose their ability to monitor everything. So they tried to stop it. Their plan was the clipper chip a government-designed chip they wanted inside every device. It would encrypt your messages, but the government could keep a copy of the keys. They called it lawful access. It all came down to trust. Trust us with the master keys. Trust us not to abuse it. Trust us that it won't leak. But nobody believed it. At the same time, a small Silicon Valley company called RSA Data Security Incorporated was trying to turn the RSA algorithm into a business. They sold encryption toolkits so banks and software makers could lock down data. But under Cold War export laws, strong encryption was treated as a munition in the same category as missiles. So shipping it overseas was literally considered arms smuggling. But that's when Phil Zimmerman pushed back. He released PGP, known as Pretty Good Privacy, one of the first tools that gave strong, unbreakable encryption to regular people. The government hated it. They opened a criminal investigation accusing him of illegally exporting weapons. But Zimmerman found a loophole he published the source code as a book. Software exports were illegal, but books were protected under the First Amendment. Activists scanned the pages, retyped the code, and spread it across borders, and the government couldn't stop it. The investigation dragged on for years and never resulted in charges. The clipper chip collapsed under public pressure, and the first crypto war ended in a rare victory. Encryption stayed free. 
But it was a close call, and it only happened because a handful of stubborn people fought back. Governments and big tech tried to prevent it, but were unsuccessful. RSA data security, indie coders, and activists working out of basements and cafes prevailed. Here's the irony. Today's encryption, the same code inside WhatsApp, Messenger, and even parts of Google, traces back to that tiny startup and a handful of volunteers. Billions rely on it every day without even realizing where it came from. And it wasn't inevitable, it was resilience pieced together by people who saw what was coming. And they won that round, barely. But now governments have traded wiretaps for AI and phone taps for new policies. The fight never really ended. What if I told you someone could know you were in deep distress without ever reading a single message? That's the power of metadata. Metadata is the shadow of everything you do online. It's not the words that you send, but it's who you contacted, when, where, how often, and from what device. And it's alarmingly precise. If you call a crisis hotline from the Golden Gate Bridge, that shows up. If you message your doctor, then an HIV clinic, then your insurance provider all in a row, that shows up too. And unfortunately, metadata has been used in court cases, sold to advertisers, and turned into surveillance tools for police and intelligence agencies. The NSA even has a name for it. It's called contract chaining. Think of it like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, except you're Kevin and your whole network of friends, family, exes, coworkers, and even your therapist all get mapped out because you sent one message to the wrong person. Encryption doesn't hide metadata. That's exactly how Natalie Edwards, a Treasury Department whistleblower, was caught. She was sending documents to a journalist over WhatsApp, and the feds couldn't read the content, but the metadata showed who she was talking to and when. And that was enough. Even Signal, the most locked down app out there, can't eliminate this completely. They minimize it, but if your phone's operating system leaks metadata, or if your contacts are already exposed, Signal can't protect you from that. So if governments can already build a detailed picture of your life from just metadata, why are they still demanding access to your actual messages too? The first crypto war was a fist fight. The second looks more like a quiet execution. While most people have been debating end-to-end -end encryption as if it's some fringe tech issue, governments have been regrouping. And now they're going for the jugular. The UK's online safety bill forces companies to scan encrypted messages for illegal content, which means one thing, back doors. The EU is considering similar rules under the name chat control. And in the US, the FBI is still pushing the same old going dark story, saying that they need access to encrypted chats to stop crime and terrorism. But here's the problem. Once a backdoor exists, it doesn't just let in law enforcement. It lets in anyone who finds the key. And there's no such thing as a safety backdoor and a hacker-proof backdoor. It's one key and whoever gets in wins. Just look at Salt Typhoon. And that's only the public fight. Behind the scenes, agencies like the NSA are already running collection programs that don't wait for warrants. Under FISA Section 702 and programs like PRISM, they tap directly into the servers of major tech platforms, sweeping up communications, metadata, and cloud backups. Companies are often under gag orders, barred from even disclosing the scope of this access. So when WhatsApp quietly hires over a thousand moderators to review flagged content, or when Apple designs systems that scan photos for child abuse material before they're even uploaded, you have to ask, if no one is supposed to read your encrypted messages, how exactly are they being reviewed? The truth is, the second crypto war is already happening. It just doesn't look like the old one. Now it's wrapped in the language of safety and child protection, enforced through secret court orders, gag disclosures, and AI systems scanning what you share before it even leaves your device. If governments win this round, privacy won't take a hit. It will completely flatline. So the gloves are already off. But here's the bigger question. What if encryption itself is about to expire? Not from laws, but from physics. Before we get into what's coming next, let's talk about what you can do right now. Governments are tearing down privacy in broad daylight, but you still have leverage. You just need to use it. You don't need to be a cryptographer just to protect yourself, but you do need to stop assuming the defaults and companies you use are safe. So here's the mission, real actions that you can take today. First, stop using SMS. If your bank still texts you codes, switch to an authenticator app like Authy or push notifications. And if your friends still insist on texting, explain it to them and send them this video. SMS is a megaphone, not secure. Next, turn off backups in WhatsApp and iMessage. Those backups are sitting unencrypted on a server wide open. Use Signal as your default messenger. End-to-end -end encryption is on by default, Cloud backups are off unless you opt in, 
and they minimize metadata collection to almost nothing and they don't have an ad business harvesting data. When subpoenaed in 2016, Signal could hand over only two things, the account creation date and the last time it connected, nothing else. But Signal isn't the only safer option. Apps like Session and Threema also offer strong privacy features, but they're less common. Signal is the one most people can actually switch to and use today. Turn on disappearing messages. It's not just about privacy, this is about your data hygiene. You shouldn't have to scroll through years of old conversations to find one important thing. Stay aware of new laws and policies. Follow groups like the EFF, Privacy International, and Fight for the Future. They track the bills and policy creep designed to slip back doors into your apps. So don't wait for tech companies or governments to save you. They're the ones you need saving from. You can start resisting surveillance today just with your thumbs. But even if you do all of this, the fight doesn't end with you. So where does it actually end? Even if you follow every precaution, it still might not be enough in the future because there's one threat encryption was never designed to survive, and it's coming from physics. Right now, intelligence agencies are collecting encrypted messages by the billions, even the ones they can't read yet. Why? Because they're betting they'll be able to in the near future. Quantum computing isn't about faster streaming. It's about breaking math, the cryptography that protects your bank accounts, the military, and even your texts all of it is built on problems that are nearly impossible for traditional computers to solve. Quantum computers cut through them like paper. And this isn't a someday threat, it's already in motion. The NSA has already told vendors to start migrating to post-quantum cryptography. China's pouring money into quantum tech and the US is scrambling to keep pace. Experts warn that if adversaries capture your traffic today, they may be able to decrypt it in five to 15 years from now. So if you're a journalist, whistleblower, or activist, or even if someone having a private conversation, you've got a problem. The good news is we already have a short list of post-quantum algorithms that can withstand the storm. We have Kyber, Dilithium, Sphinx Plus, and a few others. The bad news is almost no consumer apps are using them yet. Signal has announced plans, but nothing has rolled out, which means even the strongest encryption available today has an expiration date. And most people never realize that their private messages were actually just ticking time bombs waiting to be decrypted. You can harden your tools, you can change your habits, but at some point, it's no longer just about what you can do. It becomes a bigger question. Who's still fighting to make privacy possible at all? Here's the part no one teaches you. You were never given privacy. You only have it because people before you refuse to stay quiet. Encryption exists today because rebels printed code in books, because whistleblowers risk prison time, because coders in basement pushed out updates faster than governments could draft laws. Every time someone tried to sneak in a back door, others slammed it shut with code, protests, lawsuits, or sheer public pressure. That cycle never ended, it just changed shape. Round one was the clipper chip. Round two is in your pocket right now, hidden in legislation dressed up with names like online safety or child protection. And round three is already happening quietly in the labs, waiting for the moment quantum brute force makes today's encryption collapse. So the real question isn't whether this war ends, it's who's willing to fight the next round. You don't need to be a cybersecurity prodigy, you just need awareness. So shift your tools, push your friends with you, learn enough about the system to bend it back in your favor. You can't erase surveillance capitalism, but you can make it bleed to reach you. Now it comes down to you. Keep drifting through the online world while your data leaks with every step or fight back. The line is already drawn. Which side are you on?